Yeah, I think so. I mean, some of the parallels are, you know, in a sporting sense, no one's ever played the perfect game. So football is a game of mistakes and you often see young players, you know, young players make a mistake and spend the rest of their game reviewing it and just sort of get paralysed analysing that mistake. And investing's got some similarities with that. You know, no one accepts sort of Twitter influencers sell at the very top. No one buys at the very bottom. There's always something left on the table somewhere or an opportunity that's been missed or a crap opportunity that's been purchased. But, you know, if you perseverate on those mistakes... You sort of miss the next opportunity that, that's staring you in the face. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Conversation with Leaders. I'm Josh Gilbert, a market analyst here at eToro, and it's great to be your host for today. Before we start, a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe to our channel. There is plenty of content to keep you up to date with and we will keep giving you that information as long as you're subscribed. Today, we're joined by Chris Judd, highly regarded as one of the best AFL players of the modern day. With over 279 appearances over a 14-year career that included winning the league's highest honour, the Brownlow Medal, twice, as well as being selected for the All-Australian team six times and captaining them and both the West Coast Eagles and Carlton. Chris transitioned to working as a VC analyst before launching the Soretti Macro Fund in 2023. Throughout this episode, we'll get a taste of the top moments of his career, his best investments, the current macro picture, and how to navigate the current environment. Chris, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing first and foremost? Yeah, good. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for, thanks for having me on the show. Good. Yeah, it's great to have you with us. Um, Look, we can't get started without talking about your AFL career first. What a career it was. We went through some of it there. We mentioned the All-Australian, uh, the Brownlow medals. What were some of the most memorable moments from the career and, and how do you think they shaped you as you are today? Oh, look, I had a really fortunate career. I was surrounded by you know, a lot of great players and a lot of great people. Um, you know, in terms of career highlights, probably at West Coast, we were, we were good enough to win there the premiership in 2006 and um yeah and that sort of stands head, of, head and shoulders above all the other highlights because it just requires so many moving parts to work for that to happen um you know as a player you you particularly as time goes on you become acutely aware that you really are just one small cog in a, a much bigger organization and for teams that are able to win a premiership it, it means that you know, the administration, um, the fan engagement, the players, the coaches are, are all so well aligned and, and all working in units in unison at such a level that, that you're able to achieve the ultimate goal. So that was that was a huge moment and um, something I dreamed of as a kid. So to, to tick that off as a as a twenty three year old at, at West Coast with um you know a great group of players was was wildly special. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, like you say, not many people get to always sort of uh, live out their, their dreams. So to do that is always going to be pretty special. Um, I wanted to sort of ask you a little bit about that sort of transition from, you know, being a footy player into to sort of finance. And, and, and if that was sort of difficult or was investing always sort of an, an interest for you, because I think when we look at sort of some athletes, you know, they only begin to sort of really appreciate the importance of investing later in their careers. Was, was that a similar case for you? Uh, I was investing all through my footy career. Um, you know, early days, I'd say, with a really low level of sophistication. And, and then um, towards the end of my career, it, it started to, to invest, um, you know, it, uh, with a few more systems in place and, and, and did a better job of it. But what was always really important for me was that I was building up a skill set that I could use for, for post-football. I hated the idea of just relying on, on people, you know, for investment advice and, and other aspects, knowing that there was going to come a time when I would need to fend for myself and, and understand how the world works. So that was a real focus area of mine whilst I was playing football, for sure. Yeah. And what about just sort of that, that transition? Because I, I've listened, I'm a big Premier League fan, football fan, and um, I, I've listened to a lot of sort of players over the years saying that that transition actually from being in a sort of the, the camaraderie, being in that environment every day to then sort of maybe working in, in finance, which is still exciting, but maybe not as exciting from a personal level. How, how was that? Yeah, look, the transition's uh, challenging. It, it sort of reminds me a little bit of what most people go through when they finish school and they finish one yeah. area of their life and move into another uh, i think one of the big differences is is when you're 18 you, you probably get given more flexibility and freedom by society to explore and, and you generally have less responsibilities than you do when you're in your, your early 30s and you've 
you've got a family um, and expectations you have a clear view of what you want to do. I think the big learning for me through that period was just really becoming clear on what I'm actually good at. And I'm amazed by how many people I see in various jobs or occupations that they're really not suited to, that they're mm. doing it because they think they should be or they're doing it to please their parents or their wife or whomever. And a lot of people just aren't overly clear on what their, what their superpower or what their skill set is. So what that looked like for me was, you know, when I finished football, I wanted to start an operating business because the business people I knew and admired the most, that's what they did. But managing large amounts of people, uh, I don't think is really suited to where my strongest skills lie. You know, I'm much more suited to exploring ideas in depth than managing large numbers of people. So once I really got that clarity, that was really useful. And then to really zero in and in investing because... You know, there's a psychology around investing, which I think suited to my disposition. You know, I get, don't get swayed easily by outside noise. I'm, I'm naturally disagreeable, so I don't just believe any sort of lie that a CEO is telling me about what their company's going to do. And, and there's a competitiveness that comes with investing where we've got a scoreboard every day where we either win or we lose. And, and I really like that. And, and I like being able to explore ideas in depth rather than dealing with sort of HR problems and a large number of people, which, which other people just do better than me. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's a really good sort of lead in, I think, because you mentioned there about some of sort of the personal skills that you've got that, you know, obviously helping you as an investor. What do you see then as some of the key parallels between being a professional athlete at, you know, the top of the game to then being an investor? And do you think those experience have actually helped made you a better investor today? Yeah, I think so. I mean, some of the some of the parallels are, you know, in a sporting sense, no one's ever played the perfect game. So football is a game of mistakes and you often see young players, you know, young players make a mistake and spend the rest of their game reviewing it and just sort of get paralysed analysing that mistake. And investing's got some similarities with that. You know, no one accepts sort of Twitter influencers sell at the very top. No one buys at the very bottom. Uh, there's always something left on the table somewhere or an opportunity that's been missed or a crap opportunity that's been purchased. But... You know, if you perseverate on those mistakes, you sort of miss the next opportunity that, that's staring you in the face. So we try and maintain focus on that like you would as an athlete on what's going to happen next. What's, you know, in a footballing sense, it's what's going to be your next contest. In the investing sense, what's going to be the next you know, investment decision that's going to create value for the unit holders. Um, so we're really focused on that. But all, and also there's, a, you know, there's a, a sense of, of not listening to odds when you play professional sport. You know, you, you hear people talk about, you know, it's nine impossible for investors to beat the market. That's that's a common um, thing that gets spoken about. And equally, it's nine impossible for young kids to get drafted. You know, if you look at how many kids are playing junior football across the country, the likelihood you're going to get drafted is wildly low. And then of those people that get drafted, the likelihood you're going to have a long career is, you know, significantly low again. So you, you do have to have a component of not just listening to consensus if you want to be a professional athlete and being a fund manager is no different you know you're you're essentially saying that that you're confident in doing something different to the market and you're going to have an ability to outperform the market otherwise why would the unit holders bother bother taking the risk on you so there's some correlations with that as well um not just listening to stories that people tell you because there's a lot of them in professional sport you know stories like people in their first year or two can't play well Ruck would take longer to develop all these so-called truths, mm. but you know they're really just opinions dressed up as truths, and it's dangerous to listen to them when you're an athlete, and likewise when you're an investor. Yeah, I guess it's a big mental game in, in both, isn't it? Sort of trying to, like, say, sort of take away that outside noise and, and focus on on where you want to get to, and, and a big part of that in, in investing is sometimes you know you're not always going to make the the best investments, but it's about you know moving on to, to sort of that next one. Um, Okay, Chris, before we get into investing, uh, I want to fire a quick couple of questions at you. How does that sound? Super. Okay, so first one, uh, best player you played with in your career? Uh, I would say Dean Cox. Okay. Uh, Best coach? John Westfold. Best investment you've ever made? Yeah, I'd probably say my wife. (laughs) Worst investment you've ever made? Oh, look, I probably won't. There's been plenty. I think what really stands out when something's really poor is doubling up on a, a loser and spending yeah. good money after bad. Good point. Uh, favorite game that you ever played in? A football? Yeah. The 06 Premiership. Amazing. And the first thing that you look at when researching a company? I guess the first thing is, is what, what, what are the macroeconomic factors that, that are going to move that company 
Perfect. There they are. Some great points there. And we'll lead straight into that, that yeah. point there and talking about macroeconomics because your fund does take a top-down macroeconomic view on buying equities. I want to dive a little bit deeper into sort of what that means. Uh, so I want to sort of, you know, help our listeners um, understand, as I say, what that means, explain a little bit more, and also how you go about conducting research for your investments. Yeah, so I, I guess what macro means or, or what, are, what are macroeconomic ideas that we look for, they're, they're long-term secular trends. So a secular trend is one that can last for longer than one cycle. And we do this for a number of reasons. A, it's just what we find interesting. Uh, it, it helps explain not just what's happening in investment markets, what's happening in the world. So whenever you're thoroughly interested in something, that, that, that makes sense to listen to that because you'll naturally work harder on it because it doesn't feel like work. The other reason we like macro so much is because uh, the vast majority of investors, particularly in Australia, are bottom-up investors. And the landscape here is really suited to really good bottom-up investors looking to outperform an index and relative trade stocks in that index. You know, we don't want to be the same as all other investors. We want superior returns. So it, we're naturally attracted to doing things differently. If we follow the same process as everyone, it doesn't make any sense to us why we get different outcomes. So we like that. Yeah, and, and, and it's a, um, you know, it's macro investing is often viewed as, but generally it, it means you invest in things like currencies, commodities, you know, bonds, things like that. For us, we're not, we don't view ourselves having an edge in market timing, which often the great macro traders do. And we don't want to slap on more risk than we need to. So whilst we are a macro fund in terms of how we generate our, our ideas, we express those ideas only through equities. And we don't use any leverage. We don't short equities. It's just long on the equities. I guess really because that's the level of risk we're comfortable with and, and we're comfortable our unit holders taking on. So whilst it is a macro fund in terms of idea generation, it's different to a traditional macro fund in that we don't use leverage and we express those views only through long on the equities. Yeah, brilliant. And in, in terms of that, when you look at those equities um, and you're taking that sort of macro research into account, do, do you have a specific focus on any sectors, for example? And if so, why? And then a sort of a continuation of that is how would, you know, you say a retail investor can apply a similar approach to their portfolio? Yeah, well, we don't. Our, our focus on different sectors really is just what's interesting us in macro at any one yeah. moment. So we're not skewed towards a, having a bias towards a particular sector. There's some sectors we would treat carefully and, you know, we find it very hard to invest in biotech just because it's so largely science-based and we don't have an edge there. We don't, we don't overweight commodities per se, but we don't avoid the meat of it. When we do invest in commodities, we generally try and invest in producers, we try not to take metallurgical risk around developers or too many developers, again, because we don't have an edge there. And when we do invest, let's say there's a beam we like in mining like uranium, we'll generally look to express that through more than one company because there's nothing more annoying than getting the idea right and the trade wrong because of something unforeseen. But, yeah, we have a broad range of sectors. You know, some of the themes we like are, you know, ageing demographics across the world. Western world, currency debasement, you know, uranium, increasing manufacturing capacity build out in the US, uh, the electrification and everything. These sort of really broad based themes. And then we look at individual companies that complain to those themes. We think it'll be strong for a, a number of years. Yeah, fantastic. So let's dive into the macro picture a little bit more because it is a fascinating environment right now. We've obviously just had that first cut from the Fed and it was obviously an outsized one. It was the market consensus, but still it was uh, you know, still maybe a little bit of a shock. So on that, were you surprised by it and what did that mean for you and, and the strategy? Yeah, well, we thought we were the market was really being guided to a 50 basis point cut by the Fed. You know, Nick Timoros is largely viewed as a, as a, you know, as a Fed mouthpiece and he came out with an article that they would do 50 basis points, which was seen as a very much a non-consensus view at the time, but that really started in process. He and then you had previous Fed officials um, talking about the need for 50 basis point for a 50 basis point cut. Felt like we were really being guided to that. I guess if you look at last week's non-farm payrolls, they came in far hotter than expected in the US. So you've got an employment market that appears to be potentially re-accelerating and inflation's still not back to the Fed's target. It's moving towards that 2% target, but it's not there yet. So it's an interesting time to cut. It's an interesting time to do a 50 basis point cut. I think the narrative that doesn't get spoken about a lot 
is just what a huge sum of money the Fed needs to roll in in bonds over the next 12 months. And I think that's not being spoken about enough. And, you know, with deficits being as high as they are, north of $2 trillion per year in the US, uh, interest payment is the largest expense that they can feasibly cut. You know, it's, it's unlikely they're going to cut defence spending. It's unlikely they're going to cut entitlements and, and healthcare. Whereas interest payments, you know, annually at over a trillion bucks a year now, if rates come down, that that's a place where they can can get a significant saving and potentially not let that deficit blow out because whilst there's been a view that deficits don't really matter and we saw in England this year they eventually do and you know we saw Liz, Liz Trust move on after a deficit blowout and, and I think the US would be aware of that and, and really conscious of not wanting an event like that happening over there so we think whilst the Fed's mandate is to maintain you know strong employment and, and keep inflation around 2% we think their most important mandate that's not spoken about is keeping the US government funded. And, you know, with deficits already where they are in a non-recessionary environment outside of a world war is really unheard of. And we think the rate cuts are as much to do with that than they are employment and um, employment and inflation. Yeah, And that's it. a very different environment. Yeah, absolutely. A massive factor to, to sort of really take into account. And, you know, it could mean that we do continue to see those consecutive rate cuts, um, you know, coming in over time. And again, I think even if we still get a 25 basis point cut and we get a couple before the year end, it would still be sort of, you know, outside where we saw it from from a dot plot perspective as well. And I think we get Fed minutes um, today when we record this as well. So it'd be really interesting to see the sort of consensus view on um, on who sort of agreed with maybe Powell if he was moving for that 50 basis points uh, um, as well. I think that what's different is when, when they cut and there's a recession, you know, it's a really tough time for markets generally. COVID being, if you, if you go at what does the market do over the next 12 months, you know, COVID being a bit of the anomaly, albeit it was super tough at the time, but 12 months later the market was at, actually up in the US. Mm. The previous two times, GFC and, and post dot com boom when they started cutting, 12 months later the markets were still down significantly, but they were in a recession. If you go back further, if, if they cut and it's not a recessionary environment, which may be what we're looking at now, you know, that's traditionally or historically, that's been a, a really strong time to invest. And, and that, you know, that's our base case currently. So we think it's a, a pretty bullish time for equities, even though there are plenty of, plenty of challenges and, and nasty headlines around. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes looking past the noise, isn't it? Um, but bring it back home, Chris. Um, we're going to look at the RBA because they've been pretty hawkish still, really, in the last sort of couple of months. Um, we've sort of seen seemingly on a different path. But again, you know, in hearing from them, uh, we are in a different period in terms of, you know, the labour market inflation. So what do you anticipate will be the RBA's next move? Um, and are, are there any indicators that you're watching closely to sort of really give you that view of that? Oh, we think the next move by the RBA will be down. We've got February, but we're not really attached to that view. I'm surprised more isn't being made of just how soft the Australian economy is. You know, if you think of two negative quarters of GDP growth is a recession, eight negative quarters of GDP growth is a depression. We've had we've had now six negative quarters per cap of per capita GDP growth in Australia. So without migration you know, we'd be staring down a depression, not a recession. But just because we're stuffing so many new people into Australia, we've got GDP growth and we all need to pretend that the economy's reasonably strong. Uh, so I'm amazed more's not being made of that. And I think what it speaks to is just how much pain a lot of people in the economy are, are feeling currently. And so, yeah, I think the next move's down. But inflation's stickier than, than the RBA would like it to be. And, and again, when you you stuff 600,000 new people into the country, they all need to buy stuff. You know, it's hard for inflation to, to rip lower when there's so many more people, you know, chasing shelter and food and services and electricity, et cetera. So, um, you know, the one thing that potentially comes down in that environment is wage inflation, which is the only thing the average person actually wants. The rest of the inflation they don't want, that they're copying to the next. So I think it's a bit ugly out there. Uh, I think the headline numbers mislead the challenges by being faced by a lot of people. But I think, I think by Feb, you know, there's every chance there'll be a rate cut in Australia. 
Yeah, absolutely. And like you say, those migration numbers then as well sort of throw that volatility into the employment numbers that we've continued to see over the last couple of months uh, as well. Chris, you were saying a minute ago that you're sort of bullish on equities uh, in, in this sort of current period, given what we've already mentioned. It's still a pretty you know, difficult time in some way to sort of navigate the market for retail investors. We've got geopolitical tensions going on. We aren't, you know, exactly sure on, on the path of uh, rates, although we know they are sort of going to come come down. The, the Fed have sort of, you know, the, the, the pricing of, of those cuts has changed quite a lot. So I wanted to maybe see if you had any insight for retail investors sort of really navigating the current environment. I think it's such a challenging time, and not just for retail investors, just for all investors mm. right now, because there is so much volatility and so much of the price action isn't actually to do with what you call the fundamentals, so much of it's to do with positioning or the amount of options being used in the US market is um, something we've never seen before. And you see that throw markets around, particularly at the end of the month. And, and there's just a lot of things that are hard to predict. You know, China, the Chinese economy has been soft for a long time. It felt like they were never going to uh, pump in any stimulus. And then once the US cut rates by 50 basis point, it felt like that gave China the green light to implement huge stimulus initiatives, which... You know, we saw their, their markets rip from the monetary stimulus announced and then they announced, pre-announced they were going to come forward with some fiscal stimulus and then that fell short and then we saw the Hang Seng drop by almost 10% yesterday. So I think it's, it's, it's always important not to get pushed around too much by short-term price action or volatility, but I think now more so than ever, you need to have you know, a longer-term view, call it you know, one to three years of what you think is going to happen and invest for that and sort of stick to the plan. If you just get pulled around by each by the headlines each week, I just think you're going to struggle in this market because it is very momentum driven. And if you do get some some bad headlines one way or the other, the market can really overshoot. So I think it just pays to be able to look through some short term volatility and withstand some discomfort as as long as the longer term things are you know, things are looking how you expect. Yeah, absolutely. There's there would have been many headlines uh, that could have given re reasons to investors to, to sort of sell this year but we're still sat here at, you know near record highs for the S&P 500 that it sort of keeps pulling out I think it's always good also good to illustrate like the economy is not the market mm-hmm. you know when when even in my short investing history I think the biggest economic crisis people our age have lived through is COVID mm-hmm. and and what did our house prices do in Australia well they were ripped 30 percent so, you know, we think liquidity plays such an outsized role in, in asset prices. And we think, you know, one mistake, you know, maybe new investors can sometimes make is, is, is thinking that the economy is the market and they're not the same thing. You know, we're bullish on markets right now. We're not bullish on the economy, particularly in Australia. But a, a softer econ- economy gives more opportunity for central authorities to pump liquidity into the system. Mm. And so often when we see markets going up, it's not so much that the value of that market is going up for us it's more the thing measuring it the denominator the currency is is going down and that's certainly what we saw in in COVID and when we get liquidity injections we we think that's what we'll see again yeah absolutely so let's round it all off Chris um we've covered quite a lot there we spoke about the macro we spoke about sort of the the your view on markets um but where do you see the most value for investors right now Look, we think there's a big opportunity in Aussie small caps. If you look at our indexes, you know, the large caps and the, and the indices have generally been pretty strong. And if you look at who's got money to invest in Australia, it's super funds. You know, that money just comes in year after year. They've got money to, to buy and companies that are large enough to attract that capital in Australia as a broad group have, have done pretty well. Companies that aren't big enough to attract super fund money that rely on retail investment flows have been absolutely smashed, particularly on a relative basis compared to their larger peers. So we think there's a real mismatch in valuations there, and we think that the catalyst could be when interest rates drop in Australia, when people feel their houses are going up again and they feel more confident to put money to work in the markets. That could be a catalyst for some of these smaller-type opportunities to, to catch a bid, and we think they've probably got a bit of catching up to do compared to their larger peers. So we think there's a, a real opportunity there in, in Aussie Smalls. Absolutely, yeah. And it looks like that might yeah, we well, already had that in the in the US, didn't we? With that sort of rotation out of yeah. tacking into some of those. Yeah, which we haven't seen as strong here, I don't think, that rotation. We've seen it from particularly the NASDAQ to the Russell over there. It started in Australia, but we don't think it's been as pronounced as yet. 
Yeah, absolutely. Something to definitely keep an eye on. Chris, um, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Josh. Great to chat. To make sure you stay informed on markets, head over to the eToro Academy and stay tuned in to Conversation with Leaders to get the latest from the experts. Click subscribe and don't miss a beat.